Good evening. I will now call to order the Metropolitan and Economic Development Committee to order for Monday, July 18th. We'll begin with introductions, starting with my colleagues on the front row. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Michael Paul Hart, representing District 18. Thank you, Madam Chair. Paul Anne, District 23. Thank you, Madam Chair. Keith Potts, District 2, Washington Township. Hi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica McCormick, District 15, West Side. Thank you, Madam Chair. Kristen Jones, District 16. Thank you, Leader uh, Allie Brown, District 5, Lawrence Oakland and Geist with uh, Junior Councilor Brown tonight. Thank you, Leader Lewis, Councilor Jared Evans, representing District 22 on the Southwest Side. Good evening, District 19. I'm David Ray, District 19 on the East Side. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, Council Lakeisha Jackson, representing District 14, Warren and Lawrence Townships. Good evening, Madam Leader, Leroy Robinson, District 1. Thank you, Madam Chair. Zach Adamson, District 17, the Near East, Near Northeast, and Near Southeast Sides downtown. Thank you, I'm Maggie Lewis, District 10. The first item on our agenda is proposal number 200, appoints Anthony Bridgman to the Metropolitan Board of Zoning Appeals, Division 2. Is Mr. Bridgman in the audience? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, if you, if you please come forward. Thank you for being here this evening. If you just share a little bit by why you are interested in serving this capacity. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair and uh, honorable counselors. Uh, my name is Anthony Bridgman, and I, uh, I guess uh, is recommended for appointment on the uh, Zoning Appeals Board. Um, I've been uh, a I guess what did they call? What was my role with the Department of uh, Code Enforcement and yes. then Business and Neighborhood Services? So I served on the board of Business and Neighborhood Services for about uh, ten years. Um, so I was one of the founding um, board members and uh, was there to different you know, the transitional transitions of uh, between Mayor Ballard and. Uh, and Mayor Hogsett, that was a great experience. And um, Councilor Osley asked if I would be interested in uh, serving in this capacity as uh, a representative on the Board of uh, Zoning Appeals. And, and I said, yeah, this would be something a lot different, um, uh, kind of synonymous with uh, my background. Um, I'm a banker, lender. Um, with PNC Bank, and most of the work I do revolves around uh, real estate. Um, my master's uh, from IU's in urban planning, so uh, very familiar and intimate with uh, real estate development, zoning laws, and variances, and uh, so work with the city quite a bit on different um, projects throughout my career in community development. So it uh, seemed like it would be a, a great fit to be able to uh, help the community in, in this way and be uh, a good advocate for uh, citizens uh, and their dealings with uh, the government in terms of um, zoning, zoning appeals and variances and such. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very Honored to have the opportunity, and uh, if you would so have me, I would look forward to serving. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Questions for Mr. Bridgman? Councilor Ron A. Thank you very much uh, for your willingness to serve, and uh, this is just such a critical uh, board to be on, as I'm sure you know, and uh, wish you all the best as you uh, begin. All right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Additional questions, comments? Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak to proposal number 200? Councilor Jackson. Thank you, Majority Leader. I make a recommendation to move proposal number 200-2022 to appoint Anthony Bridgman to the Metropolitan Board of Zoning Appeals Division 1 of, with a due pass recommendation. The motion been properly moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, same sign. The motion carries. Thank you so much for your willingness to serve. All right, thank you. I appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. The next item on our agenda is proposal number 240 
appoints Victoria Betty to the City Market um, Corporation Board of Directors. If you're in the audience, please come forward. Yes, ma'am. Just share a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in serving in this capacity. Hi, I'm Victoria Beattie. Um, I am currently the executive director of Growing Places Indy, which is a local nonprofit that focuses on food access and connecting farmers to the community as well, and also manage one of the largest winter markets in the city. So I know very well how important the work of the city market is doing. Also, born and raised in Indianapolis here as well, and I'm also a local entrepreneur. I just opened up a plant shop in the heart of downtown Indy. So. I really am excited to have the opportunity to be able to serve and do the work that the city market um, is actually trying to do with our entrepreneurs as well. And I also know firsthand how hard nonprofit work is as executive director myself. So I'm excited to be able to support the city while also supporting Keisha. Wonderful. Thank you. Questions, comments? Vice President Adamson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, two things. One, big fan of Growing Places. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing uh, organization. Um, and where is your plant shop? It's 1103 North College. It's right next door to Bottle Works. 1103 North College. That's a good spot. It's called the Botanical Bar. And what kind of plants do you sell there? It's indoor house plants. House so house plants, houseware, home decor, pot, soil, all the things you need for greenery inside your home. Nice. Well, I'll check it out. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Potts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for stepping up to serve your community in this capacity. I just, your resume is incredibly impressive, and one thing that I just uh, couldn't help but uh, want to just make sure is commented on the Super Bowl was one of the most uh, big projects that the city has undertaken, um, and you clearly played an important lead role in that. So if you, uh, had a success in managing that uh, size of a project in that scope. I look forward to seeing your work uh, with City Market. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak to proposal number 240? Councilor Jackson. Uh, before I move to pass the uh, proposal for it, do you have, do, do you do any work or collaborations on the far east side of Indianapolis? Um, currently we have in some capacities with Indigo and Cafe. We've worked with them to donate food from the farm that we, we grow our food on. So um, we've been approached by several organizations to work in collaboration with the Far East Side and duplicate our programs that we currently do downtown, but we don't have ongoing um, programs that we do on the Far East Side. Okay, I love the work with you. I started recently in the last six months, and I'm doing a press conference on Thursday, a Far East Side Food um, Access Coalition. And so we're doing a big event in collaboration with a couple organizations, including Community Alliance of the Far East Side, um, Soul Food um, Sunday, and um, we're having some food demonstrations, some other things to show the access opportunities for residents, including transportation, um, breaking down those barriers. So in the future, I would love to see how we can collaborate and partner. You're doing some great work, thank you. Thank you. With that said, I love the move proposal number 240-2022 to appoint Victoria, is it Beatty or Beatty? Beatty. Beatty to the City Market Corporation Board of Directors with a due pass recommendation. Second. The motion has been properly moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. The motion carries. Thank you so much for your willingness to serve. Thank, Thank you, you for your work. The next item on our proposal, it, the next item on our agenda is proposal number 238, amends a declaratory resolution creating the Greater Martindale Brightwood Housing Redevelopment Area and Hillside Housing Allocation Area, Hillside Hotel. And Mr. Hunt, will you be making that presentation? Nope. Thank you, Chair Lewis and members of the committee. Um, Staff, Ryan Hunt, Ryan Hunt here, staff for DMD in support of the proposal. Uh, Mr. Cam Starnes with Taft Law will be presenting the project. I'll be here for any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, it's, uh, it's an honor to be before you this evening. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you about uh, an exciting project that uh, we've been working on for some time. My name is Cam Starnes, as Ryan mentioned. I'm with Taft Law. I represent the developers of this project. Uh, in, in a couple of facets that are that are moving forward here. I uh, appreciate the forbearance as well. I know there's been a slight departure from the normal schedule uh, here to allow this to be presented to you all before you end up in the throes of budget season. So we, we appreciate that very much uh, as we work through some of the 
the details and other approvals necessary uh, on the incentivization of this project and the partnership with the city of Indianapolis. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, and without further ado, I, I, I want to get into discussion of this project, which we call Monon 30. That's a, a broad term. It encompasses several different aspects of development centered around East 30th Street and the Monon Trail. It's an area that some of you may well be familiar with. Uh, Vice President Adamson, I know that you are, certainly. Uh, part of this, or a good chunk of this uh, development being in, in his district, uh, and I would say that uh, Councilor has been a great uh, supporter and very engaged with the community and with the development process throughout, so we appreciate that time. Uh, this really is a community development success story, I think, uh, that's, that's continuing to evolve. Uh, but it started with a, I'd say, opportunistic or, or plucky acquisition by uh, a client of mine of the former Woolly Lumber property, which sits uh, along the Monon Trail, beginning west of the Monon, north of 30th Street, and actually crossing the trail. Uh, and includes a couple of parcels that, that touch Andrew J. Brown. Uh, that lumber company closed uh, a, a few years ago. The property was on the market. And I think uh, my client realized that given the capacity of 30th Street and certainly the, the, the positive central pedestrian corridor thoroughfare that is the Monon Trail, the combination there could be really dynamic uh, in, uh, under the right vision. Uh, certainly a long way to go for some of the properties, but thought that it could be in long term something positive uh, and beneficial to the neighborhood and the community as a whole. Uh, in the meantime, had filed for a, a use variance to allow that to be used in an interim fashion as sort of a potentially a site for hosting farmers markets or other uh, interim uses like that, pop-up restaurants and, and things of that nature. Uh, and then kind of had the opportunity somewhat unexpectedly to acquire some adjacent parcels, including the former pickle factory to the north of the lumber company property on the west side of the trail, uh, and a couple of additional properties east of the trail. Uh, Ryan, if you wouldn't mind to advance the slide for me. Uh, it, it became really a team effort uh, somewhat overnight uh, to really bring a lot of different experience and talent to bear on a multifaceted project that can include some new residential and some commercial development uh, and, and a way to kind of creatively move forward toward what this could be for the community. Uh, next slide, Ryan, if you don't mind. So just to further orient things, uh, you'll note that the yellow circle to the north there kind of centers on Monon 30 and 30th Street in the Monon, kind of zooms out to, to emphasize some other areas of impact, including uh, the Bottle Works uh, development down at Mass Ave and, and 10th Street area, and how this could present a, a further positive node up the trail that's very trail-centered uh, and would accommodate uh, people arriving from a, a lot of different means of travel, whether it be a vehicle or a bicycle or, a, or on foot or, a, uh, or any other way that you could manage to move around the city all kind of funnels to this uh, this kind of a node here on 30th Street. Uh, Ryan, if you would advance, please. This is a, a, an aerial of the site, sort of as it exists today, um, showing the properties that, that we're discussing and kind of gives you a sense of you know, the Monon runs there at an angle. 30th Street is running uh, up and down across the, the left side of the slide there, and Andrew J. Brown Avenue, which, which also a, a good size thoroughfare along the bottom edge there, you can see that there is plenty of opportunity for access without being a, a real disruptor to the neighborhood and its typical uh, flow. Ryan, if you would advance. Uh, wanted to give you a sense of the current condition of some of the properties that are part of the development, just, as, uh, just to highlight some of the initial hurdles and challenges in thinking through how this could be reused and redeveloped in a way that's community-facing and positive. This is a plating factory that sits just south of 30th Street along the trail, uh, which, which has been acquired relative to this project. Uh, Ryan, if you'd go one more. This is, it illustrates the pickle factory that I mentioned earlier. That's the Monon Trail that runs kind of along the bottom of the slide there. 
if, if any of you have seen this from the trail, uh, you'll know that it, it might actually even look worse than these pictures indicate, but it's uh, clear that there are some structural issues there in the middle. It's a, it's a dilapidated, blighted structure uh, that has been acquired relative to this project for, for redevelopment. Uh, Ryan, if you go one more. Uh, so that I think highlights for you where this project is, what the properties are currently, and uh, I think wanted to move in further to talk to you about how it really became a development project that, that we're here to talk to you about. And that, that really, again, is a community story. It, it came about through uh, intentional and, and intensive community engagement with a number of groups. Uh, as Vice President Adamson would tell you, there, there are several neighborhood groups and stakeholder groups in the area, ranging from, uh, you know, neighborhood level neighborhood groups to community development corporations where, where there's some overlap to sort of omnibus collective groups like One Voice, Martin, well, Martindale Brightwood. So throughout engaging with all of them around a potential plan that could be positive in this area, uh, ended up doing a lot of site tours, attending a lot of neighborhood group meetings, and from there pivoted into what became a standing weekly call that pulled members from a lot of those different neighborhood and community development groups, stakeholders, neighborhood residents, a great mix, uh, led, by, led by Paula Brooks, who's of course a good West Side resident, but a, a great active community member and a wonderful convener. So she, able, she was able to bring together uh, representatives from a lot of different groups to have direct input on the future of these properties. And I will tell you, a lot of the things that we heard initially were a range of excitement about the elimination of blight. Uh, many of many of the area residents have lived next to these former industrial dilapidated properties for uh, many years, uh, and there's not a, a, an easy way forward for them in an industrial capacity. They're undersized. Uh, they are uh, have they need demolition. Of course, the the development cost there is. Uh, too high to attract new resident, new, I'm sorry, new industrial types of uses, so they've just really been sitting as kind of market failure properties in the meantime. So certainly genuine excitement about the prospect of eliminating those structures uh, and not having to live next to a falling down pickle factory any longer. There was also a, a good amount of apprehension about potential displacement. Many neighborhood residents have lived in this area for generations and, and would not want to be faced with uh, a scenario where their property taxes had increased to the point that they can no longer afford to live in their homes that they've been in for generations, which of course was uh, something we had a lot of great conversation about, something the developer's always been sensitive to, but came to a much deeper understanding, thank you to the, the great engaged community citizens there. And, uh, and also, I, I would say, an overarching sense from the community that they would like to have something nice here. Uh, and, and that really made an impression on the developer, which I, I think the team always wanted it to be nice, but to hear directly from the community, we're excited about these dilapidated buildings going away. And we want this to be a, a positive, uh, nice development that is an, a good neighbor to us and, and brings good, positive new traffic to the neighborhood. So how to achieve that balance became really the, the main crux of how to move this project forward. How to bring, deliver something that is nice and that the neighborhood would feel ownership in and be proud of while also avoiding, uh, avoiding any displacement, allowing residents to continue to age in place and enjoy their homes, uh, and maybe even have access to funds to improve where needed uh, and, and repair and how to balance all of those things. And so, uh, with that direct input, uh, that sort of created a framework for the project. Uh, the development team knew that new residential units would likely uh, be needed in order to support the prospect of commercial development, which was certainly something the community was excited about. There, the, the access to fresh food in this neighborhood is poor, as you might imagine, uh, and the prospect of having food-related businesses and commercial development was very exciting, but that is another item that needed to be balanced in terms of adding new residents, new traffic, and also it, with the goal toward uh, positive new community 
uh, faced, facing uh, commercial development. Ryan, if you would advance, please. So that, that plan really kind of congealed around that input about how to walk that line between delivering something new and, and avoiding uh, displacement or the negative aspects of, of significant new investment in the area. Uh, and this shows uh, kind of from a, uh, again, a 10,000 foot view, the properties in question related to this project and uh, how the, the project would treat them, which is stems directly from a lot of great input we had from the community. Uh, you see the trail again running at an angle there, and it, the red X's denote properties that would be demolished that are currently in uh, blighted condition. And then the yellow highlighted areas is part of the former lumber company that has some potential for some creative reuse uh, for a, a, a new and unique kind of commercial space. Uh, and, and actually, if you go by there today, you'll see some steps in that direction from an interim pop-up basis just to try to activate the space. Uh, Friday and Saturday nights, we've been having live music, food vendors, uh, and the, have, have taken great uh, strides toward beautifying what had been a, a, some abandoned and, and, and vacant uh, sheds and lean-tos that the lumber company used into something that's really looks like a great place and a node right off the trail. Uh, so I would, I would mention that. Uh, next slide, Ryan, if you would. We'll walk through some iterations here. So you, you saw sort of how the existing structures would be treated. This next slide shows uh, just from a kind of a block diagram of how they would be reused, uh, showing some multifamily on the south, well, it's, it's really east of the trail between Andrew J. Brown and the Monon Trail, some family rental property to the uh, development west of the trail and then the commercial node there toward 30th Street. Uh, and this was, all of this of course inf informed a rezoning process that was approved. Um, I think one thing that I would mention that sets this project apart from others that you may have opportunity to consider is that my client, the developer here, has already acquired this property, has already invested more than $6 million in acquisition and planning and engineering and, and design, uh, and so it is differentiated from one that's presented to you in a more of a hypothetical fashion. If there's uh, incentive for the development, then the closing on the real estate would happen and then the development would move forward. This developer's already significantly invested here and, and, and really excited to take this community vision to the next step. Uh, the zoning was part of that, that's been approved. It's now zoned CS in a way that supports this, de this development vision. Ryan, if you would advance one more. This is uh, just an overhead site plan kind of view that illustrates, uh, again, the next step beyond the, the use blocking there, the multifamily uh, at the bottom of your screen east of the trail, and the family rental that is across the trail from that, and the commercial that is to the, to the south there along 30th Street, just to illustrate uh, some of the vision there. Uh, next slide, Ryan, if you would. So getting into the details of the components that are moving forward first. One, this is again under the Monon 30 project umbrella. Uh, Monon 32 is, is the family rental component that's west of the trail there that was illustrated in the, in the previous slide. And this would be 80 units uh, of rental housing that would be in a likely a townhome or some kind of attached uh, configuration but would not have shared entry, would be commercially managed just like multifamily but would allow uh, for a different kind of unit that uh, one that our market studies and, uh, and other market research indicates would is, is there's demand for. Uh, and I think a lot of the community residents as we talked about the vision for this project were excited about the prospect of zero maintenance living option near the trail but it still looks and functions like a house. You have your own front door, you have your own, uh, your own ingress, egress uh, kind, of, kind of flow to your, to your property. Uh, this would be a $20 million plus investment uh, on, on roughly that capital structure. Uh, next slide, Ryan, if you would. This shows uh, some potential renderings of what these units could be like. You see there's, there's attachment, but they're they have their own front door, their own units. Uh, next slide, Ryan, some, some general floor plan information. Um, advance one more if you would. 
Thank you, Ryan. Uh, the multifamily component is then east of the trail between Monon and Andrew J. Brown, uh, which is being termed the domino. Again, under the Monon 30 umbrella, this would be a 220 unit project with a mix of uh, studio one and two bedroom units, uh, incorporating both in the family rental and the multifamily rental the, uh, the required uh, amount of affordable units or, or that component. Uh, otherwise, this is a amenity rich, uh, multifamily development, again, professionally managed, would be blended in to really front the trail in a positive way um, and activate and beautify that section. Um, $40 million investment, um, and we have some renderings of that. Ryan, if you want to click through the next couple of slides, uh, this would be looking from the trail to the east. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. This is from Andrew J. Brown, I believe. Uh, looking west, next slide, if you would. This shows from the trail, from the from the Monon Trail, north of 30th Street, looking back east, and just illustrates the. Currently, you've got uh, a mix of former, you know, some block buildings and former industrial buildings, and and uh, a lot of overgrowth, et cetera. So to have this kind of a frontage on the trail in that area is uh, tremendously exciting, we believe. Uh, and so that really brings us to what we're uh, here to discuss. We've, we've had longstanding discussions with not only the community, but with city staff and others about uh, a partnership or incentives of this project along the lines that uh, I think a lot of you have seen often in the past, which is a developer-backed TIF bond. So that would be the, the pledge of increment to be generated in this area uh, by this development back to the project in a way that uh, the developer bears the risk for if, if it were not to proceed, there's no uh, credit enhancement or other pledge from the city. Uh, one thing that we did discuss uh, with the city that is part of this moving forward is an 85, a pledge of 85% of the increment back to the project as opposed to that, that does depart from the somewhat standard 75 or 80%. The reason for that is uh, one of the backbones of this project has always been the community, as I mentioned, and to that end, the developer has a working memorandum of understanding with the community, heading toward a community benefits agreement that speaks to some commitments directly from the developer to the community. And one of those is an annual remittance to a uh, collective of community groups, including uh, United Northeast CDC, Martindale Brightwood CDC, and the Edna Martin Christian Center, that would be funds to be used in in whatever way the community sees fit. But the, the genesis of that was in trying to address the concerns the community expressed about the need for homeowner repair dollars and the need for funds to offset potential property tax impacts to allow residents to continue to age in place. And so really that, that ask, that additional 5%, is to offset that contribution. Um, without which uh, I think with the demolition costs and the other additional development costs related to this, the project would not be economically feasible. So we appreciate your consideration of that. Again, I wanted to flag for you that we acknowledge that departs from the norm. Uh, we feel like that is for a good community-focused reason uh, and something that we look forward to, to, to carrying out under the, uh, under the umbrella of a community benefits agreement directly with uh, several community stakeholder groups. And with that, I'm glad to conclude and, and, uh, and respond to any questions that any of you may have. Uh, again, I know this is not headed to a vote this evening, but we appreciate the opportunity to be in front of you and present the project. Thank you so much for your presentation. And again, we are not taking a vote this evening. We will take a vote at our next um, committee meeting. Vice President Adamson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, I want to uh, thank Madam Chair for allowing us this process, which does divert from our normal way of doing this, uh, just because it is a, a unique situation, uh, but it's an important process that we that we keep on schedule to some degree as much as possible. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for your presentation. This was great. I'm, I'm really excited for my colleagues here to see the work that we've been doing. Um, the uh, and I appreciate that you've been able to take the kind of time that you have to really meet with uh, the neighbors, uh, of whom I am also very proud of. Uh, they are an amazing group of people, uh, yes. and uh, they can be very feisty at times. <laughs> but uh, they have uh, a lot that they're fighting for. Yes. Um, I uh, 
want to also say to my colleagues here uh, today that, that we hope that this community benefits agreement, uh, at least the, the, the neighborhood and myself, uh, and, and I, I would assume the developer as well, I would hope for this to not just to be something long term for our city to look at in areas where uh, gentrification displacement are a possibility, uh, but also even maybe a national model that we can look at this. Um, and uh, I, I just, uh, I also want to thank the, the developers for taking serious the concerns that the neighborhood has had, and this community over generations has suffered uh, uh, what I would call municipal abuses uh, for quite some time. And so, in the interest of uh, uh, stabilizing this community into perpetuity for these residents who have been there generationally. Uh, I think this is an important step for the city to not only be a partner to, but also support it full, uh, with uh, full-throated support as well. So thanks for, for being engaged in that process and taking that whole thing serious. Yes, thank you very much. And, and feisty in the best way. I, I meant to mention the, the standing weekly call we had with the community was Fridays at 4 p.m. And yet, the participation was, uh, I mean, astounding. Uh, and and the level of engagement and thought that went into the the, the comments and the discussion were I, made a huge impression on me personally, but certainly my client as well. And so we appreciate their time and effort. And that that call continues on a biweekly basis, by the way. Um, so just just a testament to the uh, the, the wonderful people in the, in the neighborhood and and active in the community. So we, we appreciate that opportunity. Councilor Potts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your presentation today. And Vice President Adamson, this looks like an exciting project for your district. I just uh, want to confirm my math because I know for many of us on this committee, affordable housing is really crucial and important to new developments. And I, I think in your presentation it said 5% of units at 30% of AMI. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, following the, the, uh, the, the requirement of the city for incentivized projects, yeah. Great, so for the, between the 80 single family units and the 220 multifamily units of the 315 will be affordable housing, correct? Right, at that 30% AMI level. Great, yes. thank you, I just wanted to confirm my math there. And then for, uh, as far as the Monon itself, is there going to be any um, interruption as far as accessibility or usage for uh, the use of the Monon? Uh, that is a great question. Uh, I would, it remains to be seen and, and probably goes into a technical direction that's above, <laughs> that's, a, that's above my expertise. Uh, I don't know that we would uh, anticipate or hope to interrupt use of the Monon. It's certainly uh, a, a key component of the location of the project um, and would, would be needing to coordinate anything to the, of that nature with, with Parks and DPW. I think at this point, uh, from where, what we know about design, uh, probably don't have that level of detail in the planning as to the construction logistics just yet. Uh, but I've not heard anything from my client that would indicate they anticipate closing the trail for any period of time. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, Cam. Good to see you again. Good to see you, Counselor. Thank you. Um, now, I, I may have been slightly distracted, but do you have a grocery store or a food store committed? I, I would describe that as a goal. Um, no, we don't. Uh, and that's something that's very much um, central to how that uh, the, the community and the developer collectively would like to see the commercial component of this move forward. The commercial is a later phase, really, of the, of the same uh, Monon 30 development. So these residential pieces were important to initiate. Uh, again, a goal, I think we realize that uh, the prospect of a thriving grocery store there is tricky, um, but it's exactly the, the perfect tenant and the perfect use there, if you will. And so I know my client has been tirelessly working toward uh, interviewing prospective operators, talking to grocers and ways to make that happen on a permanent basis. Regardless, I would say the commitment is there and, and already kind of demonstrated to, to utilize that site in a way that can improve food access in, in a number of ways, even in the interim. I would suggest if you can't get a hold of like a, a chain or somebody wants to come in there to look at kind of like the Clio's bodega model mm -hmm. and how they've built that up as a neighborhood, not only just market, but a meaning place and it's brought so much. 
and all that money kind of go, you know goes back into the community and I just love that place and any place we can get some more of that community grocery I'd love yes we've certainly looked at that and uh, Ashley Gervitz from United Northeast has been a key uh, community stakeholder engaged in this project throughout and between uh, Cleo's bodega and uh, her work with Cook on the, on the grocery uh, concept that they're doing uh, a little further to the northeast. We have some great input about community models around it and uh, looking very actively for the right fit. Yeah. Additional questions, comments, Councillor Hart. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the presentation. My question really it's about the cost of the housing. How does that compare to what's relative in the area already? You know, my concern being some of the, uh, the houses that are existing are older and you got the new stuff, but the folks who may want to move might be priced out. Yeah, that's been a uh, topic of a lot of conversation with the neighborhood, as, as you might expect. Um, we've looked at rents around $1.73 to $1.77 a square foot, which I think that initially, I will say, was uh, surprising to the community. <laughs> Uh, I think that that price was a little bit shocking. So what we did is uh, step out in several blocks in, in each direction to look at what is the what is the market? What what could you rent in in the area uh, if you were in the market looking? And I think uh, the comparison was fairly direct. The, uh, unfortunately, uh, I think what we see in the vicinity of this development is a lot of. I would say relatively substandard uh, housing options, duplexes, single family houses that are for rent that uh, do not appear to be well maintained or taken care of, and yet the rents really have climbed to be pretty high. And so I think when the residents realize that a new unit that may be more efficient, it may not be as big as the house that they could rent a couple blocks over, but is new in a community professionally managed uh, and and well managed at a similar amount was eye-opening to them and I think that that really was a positive step in the conversation to be able to show them here's what we're seeing on the market and how it compares to the rents um, you know unfortunately they just have gotten high all over so uh, that's um, that was a realization on I think both the developers parts and the community's parts that has enabled this project to move forward and they know that um, yeah, this will, this will be a significant investment, um, and there will be some units here that will be more expensive than they would have imagined. But the um, incorporating the affordable component, and then also realizing that there's uh, there's there's more parity to the rental properties in the in the adjacent blocks than they realized was important. I would also point out this slide that's up right now has a little bit of foreshadowing in it. The that my same client, the developer has the former rail yard that's there along Sutherland under contract <laughs> and has actually petitioned to rezone that. The, the hope, and, and continuing to work through this with the community, the hope is very much that that would be uh, a property, it's, it's significantly larger, that could uh, support a, a good number of, of affordable, uh, potentially age-restricted affordable mixed in, uh, units in a, in a mixed income fashion. So I think they know that the vision actually goes a little bit further north and the overall prospect of adding a lot of new affordable units, capital A affordable units is, uh, is positive. Okay, and then just my follow up, just a, it's a different question, but you know, I'm imagining what you presented to us was the Cadillac model, considering you're coming to, you know, to the city to ask for funds to help build the project. Um, considering the, your client has already made a significant investment, I think you mentioned around six million. Say they didn't get the, the TIF, uh, the financing, uh, what would the plan be? Obviously not the Cadillac model, but what would the plan be? Oh yeah, I think without that, the um, it, A, I will say that's a scenario that nobody has wanted to spend the time tracking down, chasing down uh, into what would be value engineered. And I, I don't, I think they would tell me that uh, I'm not sure that new residential development is very feasible at all without that. So it would really be a, what what can we do here? Um, and th those are real renderings that are part of the plans that are coming together. So yes, they look good, but I think they're accurate on purpose. And I don't think the 
prospect of n not having those TIF incentives uh, means we could value engineer the project and still do it in a way that's less less of a Cadillac model. I think it really threatens the viability of the project overall. Okay, and and just to be open with every every member on on the committee here, you know, my concern is you know we talk a lot about affordable housing, and when we when we see, I mean, I see stuff come through in my district a lot, even for uh, new subdivisions, right? And a lot of those subdivisions, those are starting at $220,000, right? That's, to me, not affordable housing. And then we see a lot of the, the abatements and TIFs really come in for multifamily unit housing. And, you know, my concern with, with, with that is that we keep getting folks in this cycle of, of renting over and over again. And this is more of a broad statement, but it does relate a bit to, you know, the circumstance here. Um, where you know i don't want to see residents in indiana continue or indianapolis having to continuously rent i want to see them get into positions of home ownership and so that's you know you know one concern when we talk about the financing option is okay if i'm going to you know as a make this decision for the city to make that investment should i do it in a sense that's going to put the residents in the same cycle of renting or on a path forward to home ownership and that's my biggest reservation. And it's not just this one, but I, you know, I consider that when I look at all of these that come through here. Um, and, and, it, and it's, you know, I'm, I'm just waiting for the, the, the developer that comes through that wants to build those level of housing and I get it, right? It's, it has to do, it's a business. It has to do with the profit margins. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I don't want to see some of these folks who are, are what, what I see though, though, I want these to be nice and new again, right? I want the neighbors who live in this area to be proud of where they live and not have to look at this every time they're walking around. That's the part that, you know, I like about it uh, and not being able to get there out the funding. So you can see both sides of it, right? And, um, you know, but I, what, I, what I really don't want to see are the folks in the area pushed out by any means because it could be too expensive to rent or because there wasn't another option for them. So if there's one thing to just consider, you know, that's my take on the circumstance of what I viewed today. I think, you know, what you guys are trying to do is, is really helpful for that area. And I think, you know, taking it from what it looks like today to something new is absolutely required. But how do we get it to benefit the community the most? And, and I, I see you guys are on that route, but, you know, a lot of those comments were, were just general uh, as well for this committee for, for things that come to the future. Sure. Thank and you. and Thank you, well taken from my perspective, so I appreciate that. Additional comments, questions? Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak to the proposals? Again, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. The last item on our agenda is proposal number 241, amends Article 7 of the Code regarding payments in lieu of taxes by authorizing the Director of the Department of Metropolitan Development to enter into a pilot agreement under IC 6-1. Dot one dash ten dot sixteen dash seven and amend section two thirty one dash seven zero three to remove the thirty year limitation of the term of pilot agreements. Mr. Carr, that was a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Lewis, members of the committee, thank you. I just wanted to give a brief introduction, um, but really have colleagues here that are gonna take it. But just wanted to reiterate that we're here to um, talk about payment in lieu of taxes for affordable uh, housing projects. And these are a lot of the, the um, projects that we call 4% or LIHTC projects that are getting funding also from the state of Indiana uh, as well. And so what, what we're uh, presenting here today is really just some consistency around two processes that are outlined in state law and making sure that um, we want projects that are as consistent and as uh, positive to the community uh, of, in terms of both tracks. And so uh, they'll get into that, but just wanted to make that brief statement. Thank you, Rusty, for that introduction. Ryan Hunt with DMD, here with uh, Ellen White on our staff. Um, the payment in lieu of taxes uh, program, you may recall from last year, uh, DMD brought forward a proposal to update the local ordinance, this 231-703, um, which was an enabling uh, legislation to uh, allow DMD to negotiate pilot agreements up to 30 years uh, for affordable housing developments uh, that propose in the city. Um, that was passed. Um, now we have a we've been implementing that project for a year. We have kind of come to some conclusions, mostly a couple right here in this covered by this amendment. 
One is that uh, HUD offers financing options greater than 30 years, uh, and our current ordinance limits agreements to a 30-year duration, so there's certain financings that affordable developers couldn't utilize because they needed a 33-year agreement or a 40-year agreement. Uh, the second would be uh, <clears throat> that there are essentially two ways to be exempt and be eligible for a pilot. Our ordinance 60, uh, 703 addresses the first bullet, the section 16, which is a pilot for a nonprofit entity. Uh, there's another section of the pilot code, uh, 16.7, which is specifically, as Rusty mentioned, uh, eligibility for, for exemption for low-income housing tax credit developments. Uh, in the statute, uh, it's sort of implied that that's automatic if you are a tax credit development to get the exemption. However, um, for our agency, uh, we have right now, Council's Day is named to us for the Section 16 pilots, but not for the 16.7s. Uh, we would like you to state that as part of this ordinance. That way the development community knows that it doesn't matter which type of pilot, that you would come to DMD to negotiate uh, what would be required there. Um, and so we think that that would be provide for better consistency between different types of affordable housing developments and outcomes. And it would, should increase uh, the long-term affordability, both in the, the ability for us to offer that or to support that and in the quality of what we were getting. Um, to talk a little bit more about, that's kind of the framework, and uh, Ellen's gonna talk a little bit more about the mechanics of how uh, DMD has been and would evaluate pilots. Thank you. Again, I'm Ellen White. I'm a project manager for economic recovery for DMD. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's not um, necessarily included in the proposal, but kind of what we're working through concurrently. So the ordinance currently specifies that a property owner um, enters into a community benefits agreement with DMD and a social pro service provider in order to be eligible for a pilot. And um, really the purpose of um, the adjustments that I want to talk a little bit about here today are to better evaluate and um, analyze the quality of the community benefit that's proposed by developers. Um, and also create clear expectations um, for that benefit, kind of to Ryan's earlier point about um, the way that developers um, come into the pilot process. Um, so these updated, um, this kind of updated evaluation process um, internal to DMD includes updated threshold requirements, so requirements to be able to be considered, and also updated evaluation um, criteria, which help us um, negotiate with the developer on kind of the terms of the pilot agreement. Um, so based on this kind of updated evaluation criteria and strategy, we're really assigning um, priority to um, policy priorities that were um, highlighted during the ARPA listening sessions um, specific to affordable housing. So some of those priorities um, that we're including in this updated evaluation process are the quality of community services. Um, so when we say quality, we're talking kind of about geographic accessibility or um, whether, the, whether the service provided is on site, um, whether it's regularly offered, and whether it's specific to the target population. Um, number of larger units in the development, we heard consistently that there's um, kind of a need for units for larger families with three or more bedrooms. Um, and then any sustainability features or um, energy efficiency measures, we would assign priority to that as a part of an application. Um, and that could be amenities like bike racks or rain gardens, or it could also be specific certifications that the developer kind of includes in their proposal. Um, and then also if a developer were to exceed expectations set by the LIHTC program or another program, um, for affordability um, and seek to provide deeper affordability, um, including permanent supportive housing or um, for all or some of the units. Um, and then finally, um, assigns priority to projects based on if there are creative parking solutions included. Um, so if there are a large number of EV ready um, parking spaces or bike racks or um, shared uses with a, near, with a neighbor or something to that effect. Um, and wanna highlight also that 
this is not intended to necessarily serve as an exhaustive list of criteria, um, but just provides a little bit more of a framework for us to use when, um, when developers come in um, with a pilot proposal under either of those methods that Ryan talked about. And so with that, um, we can take any questions about it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Questions, comments from counselors? Councilor Hart. Thank you, Madam Chair. So my only concern when I looked over this proposal the first time, and it was, you know, the same one I have now, and, and it's been clarified, but I just want to make sure that, you know, it's asked not publicly. Uh, does this proposal allow for the director of DMD to engage in a pilot agreement without the approval of this committee? Uh, if I may, uh, the uh, the section 16.0 under the current ordinance that was adopted last year allows that for those type of pilot. The amendment addresses the 16.7, which is the pilot that requires a council ordinance to be passed. So that would still be required. Uh, you would still have to adopt that. We would negotiate mm -hmm. and bring the agreement to you right. for your consideration. You could pass it up or down, and then it would be you know, adopted or it would just be dead if you didn't approve it. Okay, and then, you know, so I've been on the council two and a half years now, and I think it was last meeting that we had for this committee, we seen our first pilot, at least my first pilot, right, in the time I've been on the council. And now we're, we're talking about changing pilot language. Is there more use of the pilot Coming up in the future, are you guys engaged in any conversations right now that are going to be using this financial tool more frequently? Uh, well, uh, to answer there's a couple, uh, that question, those questions, um, the project last month or earlier this month, that was uh, a 16.7 that was sort of getting ahead of this policy change. And that's kind of the reason why, part of the reason why we're bringing this to you, because when they came to us, wasn't really clear if they should come to us or if they should come to the council staff. And we are clearly the designated entity for the other type of pilot. So the developers believed, and we also believed, that we probably should handle those as staff to the council in this case. But we wanted to make that clear. Um, so that's part of the reason why. The second reason was I mentioned some of the agreements that we were already authorized to enter into as DMD. Uh, had the time limit, which did not align with these other financings coming into the project. So there's two things, really. The time limit, which is kind of for both, and then the other is just making it clear that no matter which type of pilot, you come to DMD to discuss it, and basically the requirements would be the same. They would have to have the community benefit. They would have to... Uh, you know, negotiate with us, and it wouldn't be treated separately for one versus the other. I mean, the only difference being is that you guys, you the council, does get the under the state law the authorization to vote on the 16.7s. So that's the way that it's been established by the statutory um, framework. the The other piece of this puzzle is that that is a recent change to state law. In the past. These were authorized under similar framework. Um, this would have been like pre-2020. And so usually when they came before this body, they were attached to a uh, bond financing, a, a low-income housing tax credit bond financing. So you would be approving, or, or a different version of the council would be approving that and this, the pilot and the bond. But we found that some of them don't need our bonding capacity. They just need the pilot, and they're getting their others their financing from HUD or Fannie Mae or some other set, some um, charitable group or something else. And so we can come in with this tool, and you know that's enough to get the project developed. So um, we we have been doing the the, um, the section 16 pilots. Uh, like I said, those just don't come here. Um, but we have been using it. There's a handful coming through every year. So we, we expect that to continue. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. I mean, it's just, you know, I want to make sure that we're up to speed on everything that's going on because there's tools that we don't see very often, and this was one of them. So thanks for the explanation. Additional comments from counselors, questions? 
Councillor Jackson. Thank you so much, Majority Leader. I do have one final uh, follow-up question to the proposal. Is there a place somewhere in the budget or in our pur purview where the council body will see the numbers, um, where we do see the numbers somewhere that was, what was approved or appropriated? I believe, and I'll let Deputy Director Carr speak to this, I believe we provided that information in, in the last year's I'm just saying going process. forward, not like past, but if we change the Right, code. right. Well, Rusty. Yeah, uh, Deputy Director Rusty Carr. Um, so I think during the um, kind of accomplishments section of the budget presentation, we provide a number of affordable housing units that were approved, whether by, you know, through home or, or some of our financing tools or through the pilot program. So it would be included in kind of a broader number, but we would be happy to break out all the pilot projects and provide those to you if, if the council was interested. Yeah, I don't have a problem with this. I think just going forward, um, if we're going to make this policy or change, I just think if we just make it a policy at the end of the year or the beginning of the next year, or whenever time you want to do it, just make a summary where we see how it was. Not, I don't have a problem with it if it's that way, that it just the body can see how that money was appropriated or, 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 or done. I, and I think that will come eyes will see it and it was it's done and I think that should be good if you put it in as a policy decide as the end of the year or the beginning of the next year I think that's good thank you yeah, absolutely great point Councillor Jackson additional comments questions is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak to proposal number 241 CNN I'll entertain a motion for approval Councillor Jackson uh, Madam Chair, thank you. I make a motion to move proposal number 241-2022 to amend Article 7 of the Code regarding payments in lieu of taxes pilot by authorizing the Director of the Department of Metropolitan Development to enter into pilot agreements under IC 6-1-10-16 uh, point seven and amend section 2231-703 to remove the 30-year limitation of the term pilot agreements to the full council. I, that was the a lot. The motion has been properly moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. The motion carries. Thank you so much for your presentation. Is there any other business before this committee? CNN, I'll entertain a motion for... Move to adjourn. We are adjourned.